This episode of the Creative Nonfiction Podcast is brought to you by Hippocamp 2017, a conference for creative nonfiction writers. Set in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Hippocamp enters its third year and goes from Friday, September 8th at 9 a.m. to Sunday, September 10th at 5 p.m. And for Hippocampus Magazine and Conference founder, Donna Tellerico, her goal was to create a sense of nostalgia for summer camps of yesteryear. I was a Girl Scout. I went to summer camp every year. And there's just this great feeling of camaraderie after you spend a lot of time with like-minded people. So I just thought we had a built-in name with Hippocamp. It's part of our magazine name. It also is a summer camp type feeling. So I just thought it was perfect. Um, but we do have the subheading, a conference for creative nonfiction writers, because we want to add a little bit of clarity for people that aren't familiar with Hippocampus, if that makes sense. There are several breakout sessions still available for registration, as well as slots of the conference at large, but they're quickly running out. If nothing else, I mean, check out that headlining keynote with this guy named Tobias Wolf. Oh, no, I was really excited. You know, we did have to go through a speaker's bureau and everything like that. But to find out that he was available was fantastic. We, um, you know, Mary Carr was our headlining keynote in 2016, and she was a student of Tobias's. So I think that might have, you know, helped a little bit during my MFA program. That's when I first read This Boy's Life, and that really resonated with me. We have some similarities, you know, in our childhood upbringing. So just personally for me, I'm excited, but I'm, you know, trying to um, think more on it, um, the positives for attendees, not just myself personally, if that makes sense. It's the third annual Hippocamp. Visit hippocampusmagazine.com and click on conference in the toolbar for more information about the conference. Hippocamp 2017. Create, share, live. Let's do the show. The riff, the riff, the riff is on fire. I hope that wasn't as painful to listen to as it was to say. My producer is shaking his head. Whatever. He walks on four legs. Anyway, it's the Creative Nonfiction Podcast, the show where I speak with the world's best artists, journalists, documentary filmmakers, essayists, memoirs, and radio producers about creating works of nonfiction and how you can tease out some of their habits and tricks and apply it your own work. I'm your host, Brendan O'Mara. Thanks for listening. Have we got a good one for you today. Episode 64 with journalist and professor Matt Tullis. That's at Matt Tullis on Twitter, M-A-T-T-T-U-L-L-I-S. His first book, Running with Ghosts, a memoir of surviving childhood cancer, published by the Sager Group tells the story of how Matt got slammed with a form of leukemia at age 15 and subsequently what he did with that survival as many of his friends who had previously been in remission started passing away as the cancer came back. A couple of Matt's caretakers, people who spent hours and weeks and months ensuring his survival, also died of cancer, leaving Matt to wonder why he was spared. There were several times in this book that burned your host's eyes up quite a bit, not going to lie. But Matt honors his life and his friends by turning his reporter's eye inward and outward, telling the story of his life and his friends. Matt is a professor at Fairfield University and host of the Gangry. Oh, let's just say, let's rephrase that. He's host of Gangry, the podcast, and... His work has appeared in SB Nation Longform, among many other places. You're going to dig this episode as we talk about what it takes to be a great writer, letting events unfold in the face of preconceived expectations, competition, jealousy, and self-promotion. Hey, it's the first of the month. Did you know that I have a monthly newsletter that I send out at the beginning of the month, sharing my reading list as well as what you may have missed in the world of the creative a nonfiction podcast? Well, I do. Head over to brendanomero.com. It's easy to subscribe, and you'll get the next one in your inbox on the first of the month. Okay, let's light a match and ignite this mother. 
You know, it's funny. When I was talking to um, Joe Ferraro a couple episodes back, and uh, it, he's someone I, like, quote-unquote, met on Twitter and, uh, you know, listened to him with his podcasts. And mm-hmm. and I had been back and forth with him on Twitter and email and and um, then heard his, heard his voice, heard his recordings. And it's like that the time I had him on the show was the one time I had like actually had a physical like conversation with him and it felt like <laughs> right. I kind of like knew knew him still and like I kind of feel the same way with you it's like I've been listening to Gangry for for forever and um and like heard your voice of you know read your work and we have mutual friends in uh, right. in, in the biz and it's kind of weird that this is actually the first time you and I are having a conversation that is it's really funny um uh, have you ever been out to Mayborn uh uh, the Mayborn Nonfiction Conference uh, heard, in Dallas. He, heard of it, heard great things. I have not been yet. It's the weirdest thing um, because I've gone two years in a row now. But like, uh, and so the last two years that I've gone, it, it is so strange. And then, so you take it one step further, and now you're meeting people, mm-hmm. like in person, who you've had Twitter conversations with, um, you've read their work, you may have even spoken. You know, a lot for a lot of the people, it's people that I've done podcasts with. Um, but I've never actually met them. Yeah. And then there they are in the in the flesh. And it's really kind of it's kind of surreal. It's kind of cool. So, yeah, a few um, years ago, I was at a Monmouth racetrack. I was doing a book signing for six weeks in Saratoga. And um, mm-hmm. a lot of people I know in that horse racing world uh, were coming up to me, but I had only known them through Twitter. So when I was actually shaking some of their hands, they would say like, oh, my name's uh, Norman, and but then he like gave his Twitter handle as right, he was right. I was like, oh yeah, that's you. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool though. Yeah. So yeah, it's wild. So um, yeah, why don't we jump into a couple things? You know, I'd like to get into some uh, some background stuff uh, before okay. we jump into the to the to awesome. the book, which was I I got to say before we even get into that in detail, I, it was just a an awesome awesome memoir, just powerfully told, beautifully written, and I I, I you know I was deeply moved by it uh, throughout the whole two hundred plus pages of it. So just well done. I just want to say that first. I I appreciate I appreciate that so much because you know what the like I've been writing about this for so long, yeah. so long, and I think that comes across in the book. I tried to make it come across in the <laughs> book. Um, and you know, the, really the only thing that I had ever published about that was the SB nation piece. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I had no idea. I have no idea. Nobody, nobody has really ever read this stuff except, you know, a a select few people. And I had no idea how, so it's nice to, to, to when I hear people who, especially people I, that I don't necessarily know personally who, who say that because, you know, you never know how it's going to how people are going to react to it. So it makes me feel nice, all warm and tingly. So thanks. (laughs) So what, you know, at at what point, like when did words, reading and language become important to you? Oh, you know, um, I was just talking with my daughter about this this morning. (laughs) She, she like asked me, because we've all been ta- we've been talking about the book nonstop at the house, and 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 she asked me like, when like, like when did I like when did I know I wanted to be a writer? And my daughter is ten; she's going she just started the fifth grade yesterday. And I told her, you know, like I I always loved reading, but then I think it was in the sixth grade is when I really started writing. I loved to write these stupid little things, and I had a sixth grade language arts teacher who used to like used to say, you know, if anybody in here is going to grow up and be a writer, it's going to be Matt. <laughs> and so I kind of carried have carried that with me ever since. Like, like she, Mrs. Smith must have known what she was talking about. But, you know, really, I think in high school, after I was sick, I had a really hard time reading. I couldn't concentrate because of, the, uh, of, of a lot of the drugs I was taking. So I didn't read much for a couple of years. And then, but, but I, I, I was really good at taking notes, uh, in, in high school classes and at like, uh, and at least at like focusing on, on notes and stuff. I could do that, uh, you know, paying attention to words and that type of stuff. And then in college, it kind of just clicked because I started writing for the student newspaper and I found it all kind of just came easily for me in terms of writing stories for newspaper. And so I guess it kind of just all fit together with with what Mrs. Smith said in, in the sixth grade. Um, 
Do you think it was yeah, probably like when everyone's head, heads were down, you were probably one of the, the few kids who probably had a big smile on his face while he was writing. So maybe she just saw joy in your face. And like, you know, if someone's got that kind of love for this kind of exercise, and that's going to be the person you know, that might glom on. To I think it. so. And actually, you know what? I, th- I think in that class, um, they had us do, um, we had to turn in journals each week that we wrote in. And I wrote like, I wrote like crazy stuff. I just wrote so much stuff that I think I was always just writing more. Like some kids would like just write like a sentence or something. But I was like literally, I think literally filling notebooks and handing them in. And I don't think any of it was any good. (laughs) But, you know, I just I enjoyed doing it. And uh, and and so I did it. And, you know, and I loved reading, especially like, you know, like the fourth grade is when I really started reading like a crazy third, third or fourth grade. I really started reading all the time, partly because we didn't really have anything else to do back back then. But I just read, 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 read. And I'll tell you, uh, my wife and I were talking, my wife's a fourth grade teacher and we were talking about this. Um, like what books are kids reading and I'm trying to get my daughter to read some books and stuff. And, uh, the book, the Island of the, of the Island of the blue dolphins, um, mm-hmm. by Scott O'Dell, um, is literally the book that I read. And I was like, Oh my gosh, this is like the greatest thing ever. Um, I wonder if I could do this someday, you know, and part of me too, I think it was like in the fourth grade, I, I think it was fourth grade. My elementary school started this thing called the reading games and where they gave us like 15 books, and kids who wanted to read them could, uh, they encouraged us to read them, but then th- it was going to come down to like, uh, like a, basically trivia within the, the, the fourth grade. But then we were going to go against the other schools in the district. And I've always been super, super competitive, like really ridiculously competitive when it comes to sports and when it comes to even like <laughs> trying to prove my own intelligence over other. <laughs> other people uh at least you know i I did that when i was younger and so i read all 15 books and i just i i killed it in the reading games and i don't know if that like that had to have had something to do with it too that i was just like i really love doing this so and i I, that's i think that's when i read island of the blue dolphins because i think it was one of the 15 books that that we could read so Hmm. how has that competitive competitiveness uh helped you over over the years in in terms of your and your your writing career I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I think it helps me because I want when I write a story, I want it to get as big an audience as possible. And so if anything, I don't have any problem whatsoever with being a shameless self promoter. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of writers who don't like to do that. And so so maybe it's not like from the writing standpoint um, that being competitive has helped. But from the selling standpoint, um, I have no problem loading my Facebook page up with links to stories that I've written. I have no problem with blasting out, you know, podcast links, you know, and, and promoting the book. Um, you know, uh, I'm not going <laughs> to my my poor people, my friends on Facebook. I know at some point in time they're going to get tired of seeing stuff. <laughs> Um, but I don't care. They can buy the book and then they can keep buying the book. I don't know. Um, so I think it helps there. I def, I definitely want that. That's where the competitiveness has come in here. I, one thing I'm happy about though, uh, cause I could see how it could get bad is I, I think some people who are super competitive can also tend to get like jealous of other people who are more successful. Mm-hmm. And I don't feel that way at all. Like I love it when people who I like and respect and, and like to read. I love it when their stuff gets big and goes crazy. And it's not like, oh my gosh, how could a publisher publish that book and not my book? You know, yeah. um, I don't have a problem. I love that. Uh, I love, I love it when, when, you know, and, and I love to work with other writers. I'm not, uh, as a professor, I work with a lot of young writers, but I love, I love working with anybody who wants to just get better doing the same thing that I do. And I, I think sometimes when you're super competitive, you might be afraid of, oh my God, they're going to take, <laughs> they're going to take my paycheck if I give them too many of the secrets. And I've never felt that way, fortunately. So yeah, you had taken the, my follow-up question to that right out of my mouth. Cause sometimes that double-edged sword of being really competitive can lead to jealousy. Cause you look at someone else and be like, oh my God, like I've been doing this two or three times as long as that person. Like how did, 
and I've been trying to get into that publication for 15 years, and they got there in three, and it's like, what did I do wrong? How? And you can really drive yourself mad when you play that game. Yeah, I think I might have been that way when I was a newspaper reporter, just starting out and like not winning awards. And I'd be like, oh, I'm totally better than that person. How? But I, I think the older you get, the more you realize just how subjective the awards process are. And, and I've really... You know, there are still some awards I would love to win, <laughs> yeah. but but I also know that, you know what, I mean, not winning them is not necessarily an indictment against the work that I've done and that I should just be happy for the people who do win them because they've all all done good work. So uh, I, I think I was I think I was that way. I, I think I did have some jealous bones in my body when I was, you know, 23, 24, 25. But uh, fortunately, I've aged those out, I think. Yeah, I that's uh, I was kind of the same way. I probably took me a little bit longer to age out of some of that jealousy stuff, but it's it does nobody any good. You know, you might as well. It, it's not like a zero something. It's just you know a rising tide truly floats all boats. So why not celebrate people who got there, got a great great story in Outside Magazine or SB Nation long form, and and uh, made best American sports writing and all this. Like why not like celebrate that instead of just because that negative energy is just it's toxic to the work and then you're focusing on the wrong things and then you're you're not getting any better and you're not being a good participant in this community of writing yeah no i totally agree with that and and the community itself is amazing i think um of of nonfiction writers it's crazy how many people are completely willing to you know, take an hour out of their day to to do a podcast. Of course, a lot of times they're they're hoping to uh, you know promote their own work, but or to take an hour out of their day to Skype in with a with a journalism class at a university. Like I don't think I've ever had anybody say no to like helping out my students, right. um, which is really really cool. And I don't think you get that in in every industry in, in every industry. Um, I I think writers and you know creative creative nonfiction writers, you know, magazine writers. I just think we love it when people think enough of us that they want us to talk <laughs> to them uh, or they want, they want, you know, we, we want them to talk to, to another group and we're just like, Oh my God, really? That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And that subjective uh, nature that you were talking about too is, is real important to consider, especially with anthologies or awards and, and just thinking of like, say best American sports writing, like say it gets to, the point where it's going to be evaluated by that year's guest editor. And I'm thinking about like particular, like the year, say Christopher McDougal was the mm-hmm. editor. He's got like a running sensibility. So right. it was no surprise that the 25 or so pieces, I think there might've been two or three, you know, running centric pieces. And mm-hmm. I, that's just based cause it came through his taste. Most likely, you know, it, there are probably a hundred pieces that could have made the final cut, but ultimately it comes down to the taste of that editor. So it's just another level of subjectivity and you just have to, again, be just grounded and thankful that you can do the type of work that might get anthologized there. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. You've been doing this for, you know, 15, 20 years. What do you struggle with? What are you continually finding yourself like, all right, I, this is what I want to improve on. This is what I want to do to make the next one sing a little bit better than my last one. Oh, my my biggest and most glaring weakness is in finding stories that I want to write about. I'm really bad at that. Um, really, really bad. Uh, and like I've been so thankful that I've been working on the book for the last year and a half. Uh, well, 20 months now almost because I haven't had to like find other stuff. I'm really lucky in that I have a regular job as well, uh, you know, as a professor. And so if I was a freelance writer, I would literally have starved to death about like five years ago. (laughs) I'm so, I'm so bad. And I don't know, maybe if I was a freelance writer, I'd be better at finding story ideas. Um, but I really, I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't know what it is. Um, I'm just, I have a really hard time finding things that I want to sink a lot of time and effort into when it comes to telling stories. Uh, so I, I think that's my biggest weakness. And that's one thing that I actually, I work on with my students as much as I possibly can, because I know how important that is, you know, to, to be able to find those stories that you want to tell. How much time do you say there's something like, you know, you wrote this great piece about uh, these 
great uh, like horseshoe players for SB Nation right. a few years ago. So like right. at, at what point? At some point, something hooked into you in that, and then you know you you did pursue it with all your all your rigor. Right. What at what point maybe along those roads or, or along those checkpoints do you say like okay now it's time for me to bail or now it's time for me to actually lean into this more? Oh, you know, I I, I do that type of freelancing so not that often that I don't know if I've ever bailed. I have to think if I've ever bailed on on something. I, you know, I, I think I realized early on that, not early on, but maybe five, four or five years ago, I'm really bad at doing travel type stuff. Uh, I, I, I did have a story at one point in time. Um, I think it was for National Geographic. No, I can't remember who it was for, but it ended up getting killed because it was a horrible story, but it was a travel story. <laughs> and it was just horrible. I don't know what it is about doing travel stuff, but I'm just not good at it. And and so I was, you know, I, I think I kind of bailed semi on that story because I knew it just wasn't going to be good no matter how hard I worked on it. But like with a horseshoe story, this is this is I mean, this is how I am when I find when I do find something that I know I want to write about because I'm so bad at finding things that I know I want to write about that when I do find something I, I'm typically tremendously obsessed with it. And so I'm going to find a way to make a story out of it somehow, obviously not making stuff up, but in terms of taking what happens and fashioning that into a compelling nonfiction piece, the, the horseshoe story that did not turn out at all how it was supposed to turn out. I mean, that story was supposed to be Brian Simmons, who is the second best horseshoe pitcher in the world. And the, the man I profiled going again, up against Alan Francis, who's the best horseshoe pitcher in the world. And um, I also wrote about when I was at the Columbus Dispatch, because uh, he's from Ohio. That whole story was set upon the premise that they would meet each other in the finals and that Brian would be going to try to knock off the greatest of all time for the second year in a row. Uh, and Brian was horrible. That was his worst tournament that he ever had. Um, I think he finished sixth place that year. And so I never like considered bailing on the story. I, I spent that whole tournament because it was pretty obvious early that he was not going to do well. I spent most of that tournament like really working in my mind, trying to figure out, okay, what is what is the story here? And I spent a lot of time talking to Brian in between matches and stuff and just talking about him and, and his life to where I finally came to what I thought was probably – the story should have been about and what it would have been. It should have been about that. Even if it had turned out really well, you know, um, if it had turned out where he went up against, uh, the first, the number one guy, uh, for the championship. So I, I, I'm just constantly thinking about things. And, and when I, when I get into something, when I'm obsessed with it, I'm, <laughs> I tend to find a way, a way to make it work. So what was that? What's, what was that like? That sense of uh, adaptability that you had to show when, going into that it wasn't meeting your original expectations so you did have to kind of report for maybe a different structure than you had originally envisioned so like how did how did you navigate that um you know one of the things i taught I, I i stayed in touch with glenn stout who was the editor while that was going on i, I mean i was emailing him and this was really the first big piece i ever wrote in my entire life it was the i had never written anything that long before and everything I had written up until that point had either been in newspapers or regional trade magazines, regional or you know a city magazine or or a trade magazine. And so I was constantly in touch uh, with Glenn, letting him know what was going on. And luckily he was he was very cool headed and said, just keep following it. Just try to figure out what's going on. Um, just keep reporting. Um, a story will show up at some point in time. And it really did come about like uh, just from talking with Brian, the, the main the main the main guy in that story, because you know, we, we talked for about two hours um, before the tournament officially began. Um, so I didn't realize at this point that he was going to have a horrible tournament. But in that two hour interview, I realized exactly how many health problems he had had in his life. And so I had that in the back of my mind as I'm watching him pitch these horseshoes and everything. And so I was able to kind of. um start reconciling the, the one thing I really decided I needed to do was show exactly how different he was from everybody else, um, at this tournament, because 
you think of a horseshoe pitching tournament and you think they're all going to be like yokels out there, you know, just this toss, tossing the shoes and, and, and not doing anything. And they're all super professional, super professional. It was the craziest thing I ever saw. Um, but Brian was still the one with like the baggiest T-shirt and, you know, the shoddiest shoes and the one that you would think would be a horseshoe pitcher, I guess. Right. And so I started focusing on that, and then that kind of also helped me kind of understand where he was coming from. Did reporting on that story give you a greater sense of confidence that if you hang around long enough and then just let something unfold the way it's unfolding, that you could, in fact, like shape a story out of something that was unexpected from you going in? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um and I actually kind of, I think I knew this going in and that's why I had planned to stay for the entire tournament. Anyway, I was down, I was in Knoxville for five days uh, for that tournament. Um, I was lucky I had a friend who lived uh, down there and I stayed with him. You know, I, I, I got to know Jim Sheeler real well, who won the Pulitzer prize in 2006 for feature writing for his um, story, final salute, um, which was turned into a book. And it was about uh, a Marine sergeant who has to notify families when their loved ones are killed. And Jim, literally kind of started doing those stories because he was a newspaper reporter, but he was covering funerals for soldiers. Uh, he was at the Rocky mountain news at the time. And when he was covering these funerals, he was always the last person to leave, uh, to the point where like, and then he would come away with these amazing stories, right? The last reporter to leave, uh, to the point where, you know, Jim's talked about how the Denver post and they were in the same building. They, they established a rule where, the Denver Post reporters were not allowed to leave until Jim Sheeler, Sheeler left um, because he would just hang out. He would stick around. He would watch what was going on. He would talk to more people than anybody else. And I think that's really and, and that's one thing I really tried to, to impart upon my students. And I think that had an impact on me um, when I was in Knoxville and with a lot of stuff I've done. If you hang around long enough, you're you're going to you're going to understand what the story is because uh, it's going to come to you. Um, and I think Ben Montgomery has said that too, uh, at the Tampa, at the Tampa Bay times, he said he tries to never leave an interview until he knows exactly how the story that he's going to write is going to begin and how it's going to end. But it's a good, it's a good, um, mindset to have going in that you, that you don't try to do it really fast. Uh, and, and unfortunately I think we live in a, in an age where we try to get stuff done as quickly as humanly possible because we have to move on to the next thing and we got to, you know, to, uh, you know, we got to rush through it. But I think doing this type of stuff, you have to really take it slow. Yeah. And that's where it gives new definition to or new meaning to too long form. Oftentimes that's just it's maybe uh, misattributed to just word count. But really, it's like depth and length and reporting because you can have a 2000, 3000 word piece that's uh, that's long form. If you've put in the time in the reporting to make something that's just super lean and dense, if you've, uh, if you've done that kind of work, like it doesn't have to be eight or 10,000 words. Yo, no, absolutely. I mean, yeah, long form should totally take into account how much time you spent reporting as well, mm -hmm. because you know, some of the best stuff out there is the super tight 2000 word pieces, you know, and I had a, I had a professor in my undergrad, uh, who used to say you you never make a story worse by making it shorter. Mm -hmm. um, and he's not necessarily talking about like a, a, a quick hitting type of thing where you can actually leave out important information, but he's literally talking a big feature story, tightening it up and, and making it making it more hyper focused than it was. Yeah. So when you were you know, I, just just getting out of college, starting in newspapers, probably reading re reading some longer stuff, authors and reporters that you admired, uh, what were your ambitions when you were getting into this line of work? Where did you see yourself going, and what did you want to accomplish? That's really funny. Um, so my first job was at the Daily Record in Worcester, Ohio, which at the time had a circulation of about twenty two thousand. I don't think I, you know, I didn't read long form stuff. Uh, not that it wasn't called long form stuff back then, but even in like feature type stuff, I was hardcore. I was going to be, you know, I was, uh, you know, a city reporter. I was going to, I wanted to maybe be a columnist someday, an editor someday. Um, I just wanted to like move up. I didn't really think much about what I was actually doing other than I was writing a ton of stories every day covering, you know, as much different, as many different things as I could. And then, uh, you know, I did that for like four years 
at the same newspaper. Uh, I went from covering religion and health, hmm. which we like to joke. I wrote preacher features and disease of the week stories <laughs> to I then started covering uh, city government uh, in Worcester, Ohio, which is a small city of about twenty five thousand, about an hour south of Cleveland. So I covered city government for a couple of years and kind of like got burned out to the point where I decided to go to grad school for an MFA in creative not and creative writing. So I did that, you know, I did more creative type stuff, but I was still freelancing for the star news in Wilmington while I was in, in grad school. Um, I don't think I ever started reading really good, really good narrative, narrative feature writing until I got to the Columbus dispatch in 2006. I started there in April, 2006 and I was, uh, I, I was lucky enough to sit beside another reporter there who was all, who, who was into this, like, you know, this really good in-depth feature type stuff. And he told me that you need to check out this website called gangry.com. And I was like, okay, you know how to spell that? You know, I checked it out and that was right around the time that Kelly Benham French wrote, um, kennel trash, mm. uh, which was the piece on the pit bulls, the 90, more than 90, some pit bulls who were rescued, um, from a dog fighting place, but then all had to be euthanized. And that story, just reading that literally, I think changed my entire life. Hmm. Um, so now I'm like, Oh my God, you can do this in newspapers. And, and so that's when I really started reading a lot of that, that type of stuff. Um, you know, and I became, you know, addicted to gangry.com and, and the conversations that happened there. And, uh, you know, just talking about like doing this type of, reporting and writing that doesn't necessarily look like the stuff that I had always been writing before in my life. And, and, you know, I'd always like slipped in these like narrative type elements into stories, but I didn't realize that I was doing anything that other people were doing. I didn't realize that community existed. I just thought I was being clever. <laughs> like yeah. one time I covered a city council meeting and I spent three paragraphs describing what these two city council women who at one point in time had been best friends, but then got super angry at each other over uh, redistricting. I spent like two paragraphs, just two or three paragraphs describing what they were wearing and how they were interacting with each other. <laughs> and I just stuck it at the end of the story. And people thought it was hilarious, but I was like, I, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. Hmm. I was just doing what seemed natural to me. And so to realize then that there was this entire other community of people who did this type of stuff was really, really cool. I love hearing, uh, hearing writers talk about the uh, a piece of work that like turned the world from black and white into color you know, like mm -hmm. un totally unlocked what they previously knew was possible with with a, a type of a type of genre of writing and that you know, that's happened a lot with people i speak with and um as you, after you graduated from reading uh kelly bonham french's piece uh who after that started like who were the other writers you started to get turned on to and you're like oh man that's great that's great and then and then like oh this is what i want to start doing yeah well i mean i became obsessed with the tampa bay times uh well it was the st petersburg times uh back then but um you know just like all the work that was being done down there um uh you know with lane de gregory uh and michael cruz and ben montgomery and they were just writing all these amazing stories and they were stories. And that was the thing that was really cool. They weren't articles. They were stories. And I, you know, I, I convinced uh, the Columbus Dispatch to send me to a narrative, a, a narrative seminar at Pointer uh, that was taught by Tom French, uh, who also has amazing stuff. Also done at the St. Petersburg Times, yep. Tampa Bay Times. And it was there, you know, that I started getting to know some of these people. And that's where I met Jim Sheeler. And I started reading Final Salute. And I read his obituaries he wrote uh, for the for um, the Rocky Mountain News and, and the the Boulder Daily Camera when he was there, and I was like, you know, these are just amazing things. They're they're not what they're not articles, they're stories. Uh, and so actually, you know, after after I did that, one of the things I started doing at the Columbus Dispatch was I kind of copied Jim Sheeler and I started writing feature obits, uh, feature obituaries. Um, on just ordinary people uh, who passed away in, in central Ohio. Um, and I think I did, I don't know, 12 or 15 of them. I wasn't doing them regularly. I was doing maybe one a month, maybe two a month before I ended up leaving to go start teaching. That was really, really helpful to learn how to, to start doing that type of writing and expanding a little bit beyond the typical stuff that I'd been doing. I, I, got, I started reading Chris Jones uh, once I started going to Gangry on a regular basis. 
he's uh, I think one of the best celebrity profilers in the business. Uh, I know people don't necessarily like to do that type of stuff, but uh, you know, I, I remember reading his um, profile on Roger Ebert and just thinking it was one of the most amazing uh, things I've ever read. I'm trying to think like, you know, I'm trying to think about like when it's really hard to like delineate when all these, these people come into like my mind and that I started reading. I think Tom Juneau, uh, I started reading him pretty early once I started going to gangry.com and uh, specifically his piece on Mr. Rogers, which I think is also amazing. And then you, you kind of fast forward, just, you start getting to like Wright Thompson and, and some of the people who are really doing amazing stuff right now. So it was just like uh, the great thing about Gangry, and, and it's kind of sad that people don't necessarily go there as often as they used to, and there aren't the conversations that used to take place. It, it was such a smorgasbord of amazing writers, you know, and there was always something new being posted. And so it was it was just really, really fantastic. Now, in, the, in this game, you've been, uh, you know, the reporter, you've done a lot of long writing and now you, you do a lot of teaching, but also some write, uh, you know, a lot of writing as well. And I, I wonder, like, how much can be learned in this in this line of work and how much of it is sort of innate. That's, you know, that's like the, the, the big, the age old question for MFA programs. Like, can you really go and learn how to be a creative writer? I think it's a little bit, you know, I don't know if necessarily know if it's a learning type of thing. I think anybody can learn to be a competent writer. Um, I think to be a great writer, you just literally have to love writing. Um, you have to be passionate about it. And so you're going to do it a lot. I, so I, I don't know. I mean, I, you can learn some techniques. I think you can learn, okay, well, how do I use dialogue? I, how do I, you can learn about different story structures that you can utilize. Truthfully, I think since I started doing Gangry the podcast, I've become a much, much better writer myself. So I, I, I think you can learn. Um, but I think it has to be something that you are so ridiculously obsessive about. You know, it's not just something like, oh, someone said I should learn how to write. I'm going to become the next Mark Twain. Mm-hmm. It's not going to happen that way. But uh, but if you love it and you're passionate about it, um, then you certainly can learn learn techniques. But you have to be passionate about it because it's hard work. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. always pay the best either. Right. Um, so you have to do it just because it's like it's infused within your your soul. You have to do it. Yeah, it's um, it's pra- practice and and repetitions, and it, you you hear the Gladwellian ten thousand hours. Like I'd I'd wager it's you're better off getting like you're probably getting really good at like fifty thousand to a hundred hours think, of yeah. this. <laughs> well, and you know, and that's the thing about MFA programs that are great is that when you enter one, you have to write a lot and you have to read a lot. It's not just like you're going to show up and go to some graduate courses and come away with a a terminal degree after writing a couple of papers. Um, there's a lot of writing involved and a lot of reading involved and just doing that makes you better. Yeah. Like I've, I've, you know, I got my MFA and I finished it in 2008 from Goucher college in their creative nonfiction program. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I like I've over the years, I've kind of you know, struggled with the idea of, having done that and kind of struggled with the idea of the utility of a, of an MFA and cuz all the a lot of these people that we admire all the greats in the genre of narrative nonfiction and even fiction like none almost none of them needed an MFA they just went out there and did the work so i've always been kind of like uh like should should i have just kept doing it and uh, and eventually and then you know save the time that it took to to go to grad school but in that time, in a year, I wrote a 360-page manuscript. You know, I feel bad for Tom French, who was my third semester mentor. <laughs> and I was like, "Sorry about this," but it was it did it did embed that like you're gonna I'm gonna write a ton of volume, and I was committed to writing a book in a year, and mm-hmm. that's you know that's what happened. So I guess in that sense, it kind of it does crack a whip behind you if you do take it with a a, a you know a certain measure of earnestness and rigor. Yeah, I think so. Um... You know, and the, the other thing, you know, with the MFA program is like this book, Running with Ghosts, is basically an evolution of my MFA thesis, which I finished in 2005. So, I, you know, I wrote that thesis and it did, you know, like I I think I won like best nonfiction thesis that year, although I don't know how many of us actually graduated from the program that year. 
<laughs> but then, you know, it, it didn't go anywhere um, because it wasn't it really wasn't publishable. Uh, I, I, I think it was good, but it wasn't necessarily something that anybody would um, want to publish. And certainly nobody did publish it. But then, you know, and that's the great thing about these the memoirs is you never know when the, the story actually is going to happen. And, and, and you never know when you're actually going to understand exactly what it is. So, yeah. the And in, in speaking with uh, Mary Heather Noble, an essayist and you know, na- nature writer uh, a few months ago, she she always made a point of like respecting the drawer. She's like, never kill a piece of writing. You know, maybe it's just not time for it yet. And she put it in the drawer, and it turned out to be this great sort of award-winning essay mm-hmm. that she did for Creative Nonfiction. And and um, it sounds like you kind of maybe what you needed for Running with Ghosts was to let it gestate a little bit longer. You know, you needed ten more years with it. Yeah, it really, you know, it really was. Um, like the biggest thing that I always struggled with, um, with with the idea of this book uh, of writing about when I was sick. Um, is like I never knew what the ending was and I never knew what the ending was because I didn't really know what the book was about because you can't write a book that says I'm going to write a book about when I had cancer when I was 15 because nobody wants to read that Mm -hmm. because a there's no narrative engine because obviously if I'm writing the book I survived so the reader's not going to read it. I was like I wonder if he survived (laughs) I have to turn the next page Um, you killed it you killed it already um, so then that creates this other, you know, this conundrum, like what is what is the book about and and what is the, the the story arc? What is if I have to describe this in one word, what's it about kind of thing? Because it's not just about the page turner is not going to be. Did he survive? It has to be something else. It can't necessarily just be, oh, it's a, when I came of age from having after, ha- you know, I grew up because I had cancer because that's that's boring and trite and played out as well. So, you know, it really it really did take at least 10 years before, well, I finished in 2005 and I started running in 2013. So it took about nine years before I started actually <laughs> thinking along the lines of that would actually get get me to what ultimately ended up being running with ghosts. Yeah. No, uh, what what struck me about it was you, know, like you said, like, how do, how could you elevate this to something that's not just I had cancer and I survived. It, it really it come it really came down to like as as a lot of your friends and even caretakers were dying of of cancer around you it was and you italicized this in the book too. It was like how can I how can I justify my survival? And I think that really got to the heart of it. It was like what are you going to do with this life when others were falling around you? And uh, and how did you how did how have you come to justify your survival and take the life that you that you fought for? Um, well, I work way too much. <laughs> um, I you know I um, I don't know I you know and I don't necessarily know that that's a question that I'm ever going to be able to answer 100 percent certain certain with certainty. Um, I think for me one thing that i one thing that i always struggled with was this idea of uh, which what what you mentioned like why did i survive and how do i justify that and i kind of had to come to the conclusion that i i couldn't just sit around and wait on some like some sign that was going to answer that question for me which i think i did for a while i had to kind of create my own meaning uh, i had to kind of come up with this idea on my own uh, i had to to i had to just tell myself that this is why you survive and, and live with it. And, and for me, and I really realized, I realized this after the ghost I run with was published on SB nation. Uh, that was on April, uh, April, 2015. Uh, I realized after that was published, like within hours of when that was published, that I had bits of information about, some of the people that I'm writing about, uh, some of the ghosts uh, that it, that uh, are kind of the focus of the book, uh, I had information wrong about their lives. So uh, my nurse Janet uh, is a, is a really good example because this is the first one that came up. It, you know, the, when the piece was originally published on SB Nation, uh, I wrote that she died of breast cancer, and that's what I had long for like the last 15, 20 years thought was actually the case. That that's how I've lived. When I went for 20 years, when I thought of Janet, I thought of my nurse who died of breast cancer. It turned out that wasn't actually that wasn't accurate. She had a, a cancer that started in her gallbladder. Mm. 
which I found out because uh, our world is so small, it turned out, and I mentioned this in the book, one of my wife's friends from college lived on the same street or in the same neighborhood uh, as Janet when she was growing up, and her best friend was Janet's daughter. And so she texted me like literally 30 minutes after the story went live and said, do you think it's the same Janet? Uh, and I was like, yeah. And so she put me in touch with Janet's daughter, which was great. But, uh, but you know, I, I was able to learn that, you know, I, here's this person I've been thinking about for 20 years, uh, 20, 21 years at that point in time. And I think about Janet and, and Dr. Kufus and, and the other patients that I write about, Melissa and Todd and Tim. And I think about them pretty much on a daily basis, I think. But I realized, you know, I'm, I've been thinking about these people just about every day for 20 years, and I don't necessarily know anything about them uh, other than uh, my experience with them at that one point in time. And so uh, I kind of came to the conclusion that, like, so, you know, one reason that maybe I could have survived is because I can, I can, I can tell stories about them so other people will know about them uh, and know how much they meant to me you know, uh, you know, as a, not only as a patient, but as an adult. Uh, but I also knew that if I was going to do that, I had to get the information <laughs> correct, uh, because I'm a reporter and I don't like having mistakes in my stories. Uh, I don't like making factual errors. And so I think that's kind of the, you know, that's kind of what I came to, you know, I can, I, I, I feel good with, um, justifying my own survival by, by, telling the stories of those who didn't survive. How important was it for you to to write this memoir as, you know, as deeply personal as it is, but while simultaneously bringing that reporter's eye to it? You know, it wasn't that difficult at all. It was actually um uh you know, I've been re- I've been reporting on having been sick for a long time. Um uh when I was in grad school, I got uh a, a grant to go back to Ohio. And get I got about um, 50 or 60 pages of my medical records uh, photocopied because I real I knew early on that it would be hard to write about um, a time when I was very very sick uh, and when I was very near death as a also as a 15 year old I knew there's no way my memory was going to be right about that stuff um, I knew that. Uh, that memories can get cloudy. Memories can com- be completely false uh, at times. Uh, and so even in 2004, I went back and got records. Uh, and, and that was really, really cool because uh, when I did that, I got enough records where I was able to actually build an actual timeline of exactly when just about everything happened um, while I was sick. And that was really like liberating in many ways because, you know, there, were, there was um, one instance where like at one point in time, I thought one thing happened well before another thing. Mm. Uh, and then to find out that that wasn't the case, I don't know why. It just felt really like cool to know that. Yeah. Um, it was like, oh, that's so awesome that I could find out any of this information. It's all right here. Uh, and it, so it wasn't that weird to go back and, and report report on, on my life. And, and so much of it was like, basically reading my medical records, doing the documents, at least with regards to my own life. It was uh, a little um, more difficult uh, in like interviewing the families of of the people that I write about. Uh, actually, interviewing them was not hard. Reaching out to them was hard mm. um, because especially with um, with Todd and Tim, who I write about a lot in the book, um, because uh, they – that, you know, they died 20, 22 years ago. And I knew that to have a reporter coming out of the blue to say, hey, can I talk about your son who died in 1997 would be could would and could be very jarring. And so um, that was probably the most uncomfortable uh, part for me was doing that that outreach. I was lucky in that one of the patient's moms, Melissa's mom, actually reached out to me as, you know, as as did uh, uh, Janet's daughter because they read the piece. I didn't know Melissa's mom at all. I don't know if I'd ever talked with her um, before uh, when I was a kid. But I mean, it just so happened that like, you know, the my the university I was at prior to here in my alma mater, Ashland University, they re-ran the ghosts I run with in the alumni magazine 
And it just so happened that Melissa's mom read the piece in the magazine and she was like, I think that's my Melissa. And it's another example of something I got wrong. I had, I had Melissa's cancer wrong as well. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so she reached out to me and, and, and that, you know, that makes it so much easier than, you know, cause I'm the reporter now. Hey, thanks for giving me a call. I really appreciate this. Hey, by the way, I think I'm doing a book on this. Can I talk to you sometime? And, and she was really open to it. And, and I think most of the families were, were open to talking with me, but it's still hard to know that, that as a reporter, you're, you're kind of ripping off a, a 20 year old band aid. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and, kind of pushing them into having to think about that again. And I don't think they, I don't think they ever regretted, you know, I haven't really talked with them about this, so I don't know, but I, I I can't imagine they regretted talking about someone they loved, but I do know that that can be, it can be, it can be hard. So you write about this, this well, and I I just want to maybe get you to articulate it too, is you write about the, the awareness of your own mortality really well. And that hit you at 15 years old. And I was just like, what was, you know, it, in that sense, that, ex, that experience like to be in that position in room 462 and you're, at such a young age, having to confront that question that some people don't have to confront until they're, you know, at least till they're a fully formed adult. Yeah. You know, it was, um, I just remember feeling so bad, just so bad. Uh, and this is the, the, the thing about cancer uh, and leukemia and pretty much anything that has to be treated with chemotherapy is, and, and fortunately, I'll segue here, I think we're moving away from the really heavy-duty chemotherapy that just destroys a body, uh, moving to more targeted therapies, which is way better for a cancer patient. Mm-hmm. But in 1991, it was still massive heavy doses of these horrible drugs and they just made me feel so bad that I, I, you know, I literally, I, I just remember laying in that bed and not really caring what happened. Um, just wanting it to end in some way, shape or form. Um, and that's kind of what I remember. And, and, you know, and, and, and a lot of the nursing notes, that's kind of, that shows up sometimes. Uh, but also I think sometimes like, uh, I, 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 you know, when I think about that time when I was sick, I'm, it's always the, the worst, right? I, I think about how horrible I felt. That's really all I think about. But apparently, like, there are, you know, one of my nurses, Teresa, who I read about a little bit in the book, she said that she loved to be my nurse because she thought I was funny. And I was like, how was I even remotely funny <laughs> um, at that time? But I really do just, you know, I... The, the the clearest memory for me is just staring out the window uh, that was beside the bed that I laid in and just not ever wanting to get up. It wasn't even frightening at the time. I, I think it's more frightening to look back on now uh, as an adult and to realize that as a 15 year old, I felt that way. But it was really just so the drugs are just so bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, it really is um, a, an absolute, uh, you know, a carpet bombing of of the body. It's, it's mutual destruction of good and bad, um, uh, in order to eliminate the, the, the cancer cells. And I just remember thinking as a kid, as like, you know, as a 15 year old that, you know what, I don't care, you know, whatever happens, happens. Um, just, just make it stop. Mm. And, uh, you, as you, uh, progressed in it, things, you know, you defeated, uh, well, the antibiotics knocked out an infection in your brain and you start to go into remission. You, you talked about that, the, the Matt Tullis that entered the, the hospital on January 4th, 1991, like he died, but from those sort of ashes, if you will, this turns into a resurrection story in a lot of ways. Like you left that behind. And, uh, what was, yeah, you know, what was that like? You know, making that delineation for yourself in 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 the book, and all right, just going going forward with that, like you you had escaped that that moment, and you were able to sort of push push through that. Yeah, you know, and maybe what would that Matt tell us like think of you right now? Oh man, he'd be so disappointed that I'm I'm not finishing my career with the Chicago Cubs right now. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the th- I did realize um, that 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 um, the old Matt Tullis was was gone, 
but I didn't realize that until I didn't realize that for a long time or I didn't like, maybe I realized it, but I would I refused to, um, accept it. Um, it took me a long, a really long time where, uh, I just wanted everything to be back to normal and I was just going to be the kid I was supposed to grow up to be, um, which was the starting second baseman for the Chicago Cubs, mm-hmm. uh, who was going to replace Ryan Sandberg when he retired. Uh, that never have, I should be having my farewell season right now. So, yeah. um, so, you know, I got out of the hospital and, and I really, in many ways, did everything I could to try to be who I was before I went in. Um, I, I, uh, doubled up on classes so I could graduate with my own high school class cause I missed an entire half a year of school. I actually missed about it. When you, when you talk about credit wise, I had missed basically the entire year. I had half a credit for my freshman year from typing class. Um, so glad I could type fast. So I doubled up on classes. All I wanted to do was graduate with my friends. You know, I went back and I started playing baseball again and I went toilet papering people's houses with my friends and, uh, you know, really did everything I could to just like pretend like nothing had ever happened. And that, that continued into college really, really until I, I think some of, some of the, uh, some of the people I knew started dying. And even then I think I kind of refused to accept that, that my life path was irrevocably changed based on what had happened. And so I don't, I mean, I don't know if I even realized that until just, you know, when I started running and started thinking about, uh, these, these people who didn't, who didn't, um, who didn't survive, uh, and that, and, you know, as they do more and more studies, in the, into the long-term effects of childhood cancer, especially survivors, you start to realize that the drugs that they save your lives with when you're that young are themselves carcinogens. They will cause cancer again at some point in time. And so, you know, when I was younger, I pretended I, you know, I, I didn't know that. And so I could try to pretend to be this normal person again. And, And as you get older, you start to realize that that's not necessarily the case. I actually one of one thing about long term effects of, of cancer treatments. Um, just yesterday, a, re, a really good friend, or a really good acquaintance, and a fellow writer. His name was William Bradley. He wrote the book Fractals. Uh, he also had he had uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma when he was twenty one. Uh, we were the same age, so it was about twenty years ago. He just passed away yesterday, um, based uh, from a cancer that was caused by the radiation that saved his life. Mm. Uh, when he is 21. And so for like the last 12 hours, uh, since I read a Facebook post about his passing, that's all I've thought about is, you know, these long-term side effects. And, and, and I, I think I'm fine, uh, aside from, uh, some skin cancers on my head caused by the radiation therapy that I had. But, uh, you know, the old Matt Tullis, uh, is lucky or the new Matt Tullis is lucky to be dealing with these types of things now because he's been alive for, 26 more years, but you also have that lurking in the background. You know, you don't ever know if you're completely done with it. Yeah. How does that affect and it's maybe inform your life now, knowing that there is this sort of stealth ghost that could, that could in fact like rear its ugly head again. I think the main thing for me is, and I didn't start doing this until recently, but being super vigilant of like, my health and seeing the right doctors, uh, seeing the right specialists that I need to see for a long time. Uh, I refused to go to doctors, especially after my, uh, especially after Dr. Kufus, my doctor, my pediatric oncologist died. Um, I did everything I could afford. I could to not go to doctors. Um, part of that was, was because we moved a lot. Uh, we moved from Worcester, Ohio to Wilmington, North Carolina, back to Worcester, Ohio, then to Columbus, then to, uh, we just moved moved around a lot for a variety of reasons, mostly job related. Um, but I never really set up a, a relationship with a doctor. But within the last year, especially since we moved to Connecticut, um, I've been really vigilant about um, making sure that I'm seeing the doctors I need to see. Um, I'm doing the things uh, that they say I need to do. For so such a long time, I was so not healthy in terms of how I eat as well as in the utter lack of exercise. Like I was always considered myself a sporty person when I was younger. 
Um, but for whatever reason, as I got older and had kids, I just stopped doing anything athletic and I would literally sit on my butt all day and do nothing. Hmm. And, uh, you know, in 2013 I started running and I lost like six, 40 pounds, gained a few back, but, <laughs> uh, um, you know, I started running a lot and so that helped a lot, uh, at least in my mindset, uh, it helped me feel a little bit better, it, but just, you know, seeing doctors on a regular basis and being cognizant and knowing what the, the, the medicines could do to my body, you know, and I'm 20, almost 27 years out now and that's getting pretty far. And, and I, I feel like, you know, maybe I might be getting to this like place where, if all I have to deal with are, are basal cells, you know, basal cell skin cancers on my head, which are literally just a pain because uh, they, they, they just have to cut them off. Um, but if that's all I have to deal with, then that's a, I think that's a pretty, pretty good bargain. And, you know, I'm, I'm running again now that we got settled in Connecticut. And so I'm, I'm, I'm grounding back into running shape and getting ready to run the Akron Marathon for the third time this here in September. Uh, so... With so, team and training, it probably right. Uh, I'm actually uh, Akron. I'm not doing for team and training. Okay. Uh, I'm doing it uh, on my own, uh, but I am running the Philadelphia Half Marathon uh, in November for team and training, um, which I'm really, really excited to do. Uh, I have not done anything with the team uh, since uh, since Ak since the Akron Marathon in 2014. Uh, well, I did another race with them shortly after that, but. Uh, it's been since 2014 since I, since I've done anything with them and I'm really excited to be doing that here in November. Cool. And I've just got a, a few more questions I'd love to ask you kind of, kind of rapid fiery, but they don't okay. necessarily require rapid fire answers. Say, um, what are some books that you find yourself rereading time and again? Uh, it's funny. Tom, do you know, just put something like this on Facebook, uh, and I answered it and now if, we'll see if I can remember what I answered. <laughs> um, I read, uh, the th uh, Tim O'Brien's the things they carried at least once a year. It is, uh, without a doubt, the most um, impactful book that I've ever read in my entire life. I'm, I'm looking, I'm, I'm scanning my bookshelf right now, trying to see if there's any. Most of the books that I read more than once are all at my house, and I'm in my office right now. Um, I, I, I read Paul Auster a lot. I, I don't know. Uh, I just love his narrative structure for his novels. Nonfiction-wise, uh, I'm totally going to come up empty on this. You know, I not necessarily any books, but um, anything that John Jeremiah Sullivan writes, I'll read because I think he's amazing. Um, his book Blood Horses is ridiculous. His book Pulp Head is even better. It's a collection of his pieces. I've never read that a couple of times. Yeah, so I think uh, really, though, um, the things they carried is, is probably the most prominent one. And, and that's the easiest one for me to come up with just because I read it. All the time, I've got a, a I got a sentence from it tattooed on my left forearm from the the story, the lives of the dead, at the end of the book. Uh, the, the but this too is true. Stories can save us, uh, which I think is um, one of the greatest opening lines of any short story ever. Hmm. What did a successful writer look like to you when you were say twenty and thirty and even then forty? And how does that how does that evolved? Oh man, when I was 20 or, you know, 20, I was going to win a Pulitzer prize and I was going <laughs> to, I don't know. I have no idea. I just wanted to like, I think when I was 20, my idea, you know, this goes back to when I was in high school too. Um, and I think this has something to do with having been sick, but I desperately wanted to write a book even then that 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 everybody would know everybody would have to read i remember thinking in, in an american literature course uh that i hope someday i'm going to write a book that in a hundred years students are going to have to read in american literature and they're going to hate me <laughs> uh so you know when i was 20 i wanted to i desperately you know even in my first newspaper job i desperately I, I i wanted to my goal was to win a pulitzer prize uh, but I also, even then I knew I wanted to write a book at some point in time. Um, and, and I had bigger aspirations for what that book would be. Um, when I was 30, you know, I was just, um, I'm trying to think I was, I was just finishing up the MFA program, uh, at UNCW. And so obviously I think I was more hyper-focused on the memoir and the book, um, maybe too much so. But again, I think then, uh, you know, success then was like a big, nice big advance, from a publisher on, 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 on the book. Uh, and then maybe a second book at some point in time. Now 
you know, for truthfully, uh, I, I think it's a success just to have the book done and to know that some people will read it and will possibly be moved by it and, and, and will, and will carry away, um, thoughts of, uh, my doctor and my nurse and, and Melissa and, and Tim and Todd, uh, they'll carry uh, thoughts away with them in their brain somewhere. Uh, and, and so, you know, uh, that for me, that's a success right now uh, as a writer. Uh, also, you know, having another book at some point in time wouldn't hurt either. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, but uh, I think that's the biggest thing is just that it's done uh, it, and, and, and the, the, some people will read it. And, and for me, that's success. Very nice. I think I think that's a great place to end our conversation on, Matt. That was, uh, like I said, the your your book is wonderful. I wish you the best of success with it, and uh, I think it's going to affect a lot of people and and uh, and move a lot of people too, and, and and maybe inspire people to live a more enriching life. You know, the way you were able to honor your friends that have passed away and their caretakers, and the way that you've chosen to live a, this life of intention and and language and words and doing what you do. So I think uh, I think you've mission accomplished with the book, and I wish you the best of success with it. Oh, thanks so much, and, and thanks for having me on the podcast. Thanks again to Hippocampus Magazine and the third annual Hippocamp for sponsoring this week's episode. I can't wait to one day attend, maybe record a bunch of pods on site. Sounds like a good time. Can't wait to do it. Anyway... If you made th- made it this far, friends, let me ask you for reviews on iTunes. They help more than anything. Gives a little extra cred, helps with rankings, and uh, allow me to keep doing this kind of thing if you dig it. Want to say hi? I'm at Brendan O'Mara on Twitter and Instagram, where I often post pics of my storyboards and other fun show-your-work type stuff. Until next time, keep doing the work, and let's keep encouraging each other. Thanks for listening. See ya.